Okay, in this video, we are going to have a look at this ARM microcontroller, which I have on my breadboard. Now, this is the STM32F411, so it's a Cortex M4 microcontroller. So now we have a Cortex M4 microcontroller on a DIP package module, so we can plug it into a breadboard for easy development. Now, this microcontroller has 512K of flash, 128K of RAM, and we can clock it up to 100 megahertz. Now this microcontroller is a step up from the blue pill, which you're probably familiar with. And on the blue pill module we have a reset button, and we have two jumpers, the boot zero and boot one jumper. Now on this module, we have a boot zero push button, and we have a reset push button, and we have a user push button. So we have a user push button and a user LED, so we could use them to practice writing to a GPIO pin with the LED, and reading a GPIO pin with the push button. Okay, here's my setup for development. So I have an FTDI module, that's a USB to serial converter, and I have that connected up to the USART2 on the microcontroller using GPIO pins PA2 and PA3. And you can see the TX and RX lines feeding down to the FTDI module. Now I'm running a fourth operating system on board the microcontroller. So I have an onboard compiler, interpreter, and programmer. So all the tools that I need are running on board the microcontroller. So all I need to do is run a serial terminal program like PuTTY or TerraTerm and I can get access to the microcontroller for development. Now to upload a hex file or a, or a binary file into the microcontroller we have three ways of doing it. We could use the flash loader which uses USART1 which is GPIO pins PA9 and PA10 which you can see here there's your TX and RX. So all I have to do is move my FTDI module over to here. And now I can upload a hex file or a bin file using the flash loader using USART1. Now the second way is using SWD, serial wire debug. We can see these pins here. And we use a dongle, an ST-Link dongle, like this. And we can plug that in to the SWD pins and we could upload a hex file or a bin file. And the third way is through the USB connector. Now this is a Type-C USB connector. And we could run Defuse, which is a, a software that we could upload a DFU file. So we convert our hex file or a binary file into a DFU file and we could upload it into the USB port into the microcontroller. So those are three ways we could upload a hex file into the microcontroller, the STM32F411 Cortex-M4. Okay, now if you want to upload a hex file or a .bin file into the microcontroller using the flash loader through USART1 or through the USB port where you could upload a .dfu file using Dfuse, we have to put the microcontroller into bootload mode. And to do that, we use a reset and boot zero push buttons. So you notice my LED is on, indicating my fourth operating system is running. And if I hit the reset button, it goes out, so it's not running, it's in reset mode. I release the reset button and she boots up into my fourth operating system. Now to put it into bootload mode, we hold down the reset button so no program is running. Then we hold down the boot zero button. Now we release the reset button and the microcontroller will see that the boot zero button has been pressed and it will go into bootload mode. Now when I release the boot push button, you can see my LED is not on. So now the microcontroller is in bootload mode. Okay now, if you want to upload a .hex file or a .bin file into the microcontroller using the SWD pins, that's a serial wire debug, all you need to do is have SD-Link running on your computer, plug the SD-Link dongle into the USB port, and connect the wires between the SD-Link dongle and the microcontroller. Now we're using pins 2, 4, 6, and 8 on the dongle, and you connect them up to the corresponding pins on the microcontroller. Now we don't have to use the boot zero or the reset buttons on the microcontroller. We do not need to put the microcontroller into bootload mode when we're using the ST-Link dongle. So we just plug in the dongle, run ST-Link, and upload our .hex file or our .bin file. Okay, I have ST-Link up and running on my computer. And I have my dongle plugged into the USB port of my computer, which is connected to my microcontroller. Now the dongle is actually supplying 3.3 volts to the microcontroller so we're ready to go. So we'll connect to the microcontroller. You can see there she's connecting. 
and it says connected via SWD and you can see it sees the STM32F411 microcontroller so now we're going to upload a hex file into the microcontroller and you just hit the browse button and find out where your hex file is on your computer and there I'm going to upload mcrisp.hex that's my fourth operating system now you just hit start so you can start programming and on the bottom the very bottom it says verification OK. So I have uploaded my hex file into my microcontroller. OK, I have Flash Loader up and running on my computer. And I have my FTDI module connected to USART 1 of the microcontroller. That's GPIO pins PA9 and PA10. So now I'm going to do the sequence. I'm going to put the microcontroller into the bootload mode by using the reset button and the boot zero button. So I'll do that now. So I'm holding down the reset button, the boot zero releasing the reset now releasing the boot now when I hit next it says target is readable so hit next and next and go to download to device and there's a browse button and you could just browse to see where your hex file is and there's a mcrisp.hex so hit next and you can see it's downloading the data so it's uploading my mcrisp operating system mcrisp.hex She's almost done. And there it's done. Download operation finish successfully. So that's how you upload a hex file using the flash loader and using USART 1. Okay, I have Dfuse up and running on my computer. And I have a USB cable from my computer to the USB connector on my microcontroller. And it's a Type C USB cable, so it's compatible. And I did the sequence, I did the boot load sequence with the reset button and the boot zero button. And you can see in the top it says available DFU devices. And it says STM device in DFU mode. So it sees my microcontroller. So we go down to choose. And there's my mcrisp411.dfu. So I, I converted my hex file into a .dfu file with the utility. So we'll select that. And on the bottom it says file correctly loaded. So now we do upgrade and go yes. You see in the bottom, upgrade successful. So that's how we upload a .dfu file into the microcontroller using Dfuse software. Okay, so that was a little refresher on how to upload a hex file into the ARM microcontroller using the three types of bootloaders. Now you can see when you're uploading a hex file using the USB connector that the USB cable is actually powering the board. You can see my LED lights are on. Now personally, I like using ST-Link and the ST-Link dongle to upload a hex file into the microcontroller because the ST-Link software has a lot of options but you could use whatever is easiest for you to upload a hex file into the microcontroller now I've been using the blue pill module for a lot of my ARM projects but now this is my go-to uh, module we're going from a Cortex-M3 to a Cortex-M4 and the Cortex-M4 architecture is a lot better a lot of improvements have been made so this will be my go-to board for ARM programming. So next I'll give you a little tour of this board. We'll have a look at some of the pinouts and what they do. And we'll get into the fourth operating system. Okay, next we are going to look at the pinout of the STM32F411 module. Now most of the pins are the GPIO. And the GPIO ports are 16 bits in length. And they're all labeled on the module itself. Now the two dominant ports are port A and port B. So we'll look at port A. Port A pin 0. It's our push button switch and it's labeled key. So it's our user push button switch and it's connected to ground. Pin 2 and 3 is a USART 2. And that's how I communicate with my fourth operating system. So pin 2 is TX and pin 3 is RX. Then we have pin A4, 5, 6 and 7. Which is our SPI flash. Now that's an option. If you look on the back of the module you could see a solder pad and we could solder in there an SPI flash chip and that'll be the same as an SD card for data logging. Pins 9 and 10 is USART 1 and that's our bootloader our flash bootloader to upload a hex file so pin 9 is TX, pin 10 is RX pin 11 and 12 is the USB data lines for the USB connector pins A13, 14 and 15 are JTAG and they're dual function, they're also the SWD, 
So pins 13 is a DIO, pins 14 is a, is a S clock, and that's our serial wire debug. And I have a box around it because they're not brought out to the perimeter, outer perimeter pins. They're just brought out to this, this uh, connector here. If we go to port B, pin 2, that's our boot 1. So it's grounded with a resistor. So if we apply 3.3 volts to B2, we'll activate the boot 1 bootloader. And pins 3 and 4 of port B is, is also the JTAG. So we have 5 JTAG pins, 3 in port A, and 2 in port B. Now if we go down to port C, pin 13, that's our user LED, and it's active low, so if we drive pin 13 low, we'll turn on the LED, and if we drive it high, we'll turn off the LED. Pins 14 and 15 is where the 32 kilohertz crystal is connected to, that's our real-time clock. And pins H, 0 and 1 is our 25 megahertz crystal, which clocks our microcontroller. So there's the pinout. And we can use that for a reference when we're programming and building our ARM project. Okay, we're looking at the data sheet of the ARM microcontroller regarding the general purpose I.O., the GPIO. Now on a power-up reset, the microcontroller is going to configure the five JTAG pins as alternate function pins. Now it does this automatically on reset. Now uh, a JTAG is a universal standard that vendors follow for programming and debugging microcontrollers. Now ST Microelectronics has come up with their own JTAG, it's SWD, Serial Wire Debug, so pins 13 and 14 are dual function. So you see there the SW clock and the SW data line is the SWD. Now on power up, these are configured as alternate function pins and if we write code and if we corrupt any of these pins, if we change the alternate function uh, configuration, it could cause problems in our code. And our, pro and our programs won't work properly. So this is pretty important and we'll look into this a little bit deeper. Okay, here's the data sheet showing the GPIO port mode register. Now the port mode register indicates what the mode is of each GPIO pin. If you look at the bottom, 1-0 indicates alternate function mode. So on reset, port A and port B have special reset values, you can see here. And those reset val values will set the five JTAG pins to alternate function mode 1-0 on reset. And we'll see that later on when we get into the fourth operating system. Okay, I got my breadboard set up for development. I got my FTDI module connected up to USART 2 of the microcontroller so I could gain access to my fourth operating system. Now the purpose of this video is just a little primer to program Cortex-M4 ARM microcontrollers so in the beginning of the video I showed how you could upload a hex file using three different bootloaders to get you started. So I'll be using the fourth operating system and the fourth programming language which is interactive and as an example I could turn on the LED on the board by sending a command. You can see the LED is on and I could send a command to turn it off and this is all interactive so it's off and I could send the command to blink the LED and she's blinking. So in the rest of the video, I'm going to get into some mistakes that students get into, some programming mistakes, and how to correct it. It's a very common mistake I see. So next we'll get into the fourth programming language and the fourth operating system. Okay, I have TerraTerm up and running on my computer. And I have my fourth operating system running on my ARM microcontroller. And if I press enter on the keyboard, you see I get an OK prompt. And I'll press the reset button on my ARM board. There's my hello screen. You can see I'm running my McCrisp fourth operating system and the frequency is 100 megahertz. So if we look at the mode of port A, there's the mode registers and you can see the legend on the bottom. So 1-0 is alternate function. So on port A, if we go to pin 3, it's 1-0, it's alternate function. Pin 4, so that's my USART 1, that's how I'm communicating um, into the fourth operating system. And there's the three JTAG pins on port A, 13, 14, and 15, so they're alternate function. So on reset, pins 13, 14, and 15 are alternate function. So now if you look at the config of port A, so we go port A,
You can see pins 2 and 3 is alternate function mode. That's my USART 2. That's how I'm communicating with the fourth operating system. And pins 13, 14, and 15 are alternate function mode, the JTAG. So now if I'm writing a program, and say I want to hook up a push button switch to pin 14, I have to make it an input. So I'll do that. So port A, pin 14, input. Now if we look at the port A again, we can see pin 14 is an input. So we write our code, we hook up our switch, everything works good until we want to reprogram the ARM microcontroller, then we run into problems. So we'll go over to SD Link and we'll have a look at the problem that we just caused. Okay, I have ST Link up and running on my computer and it's connected to my ARM microcontroller. So I want to do some upgrades on my software. So I hook it up and I go to connect. And I get cannot connect to target. It says please connect under reset. So I'll try it again. I'll go up to connect. And I get this error. So it says please try to connect under reset. Okay, so I go to settings. And it's set for normal. So I'll do connect under reset. Do okay. I still get an uh, error. So the way to get out of this, go to the arm board, press and hold the reset button. So I'm pressing and I'm holding the reset button on the arm microcontroller. And I go up to connect. I press connect. Now I release the reset button. And now we're in. Now it's connected to the microcontroller. So now I could erase, I could do a total erase of the chip and redo my code, fix my code. Because I, I corrupted pin 14 on port A, and that's part of the SWD, so that's why we could not connect. So if I disconnect, I try to connect again, I'm getting that error. Okay, so that's a common problem I see when students are programming ARM microcontrollers. So by pressing and holding down the reset button and then re releasing it at the right time, we're getting into the microcontroller before the corrupt code can run. So the ARM microcontroller is a very complex microcontroller, so you have to be aware of what's going on inside. That's why I, I use the fourth operating system and fourth programming language. So this video has gone quite long, so I'll shut it down here. So I hope this video gave you a little primer on how to start programming a Cortex-M4 ARM microcontroller.